So Chanel, great to finally meet you. Thank you so much for uh, sparing a bit of time for us today. You're welcome, likewise. And um, congratulations on all the recent success. Um, before we get into all your, your latest sort of success, I kind of want to look back really to the beginning and find out more about um, your early life in Jamaica. So I was born in St. James. I was raised in the Western region, more Western, like Hanover of Jamaica with my grandparents in my earlier stages. Um, I moved back to Montego Bay in my latter part of my youth, youth days. And I lived with my mom then. So I moved, I was actually living in closer to the Negro side of Jamaica if you know exactly where that is. So yeah. So I, I grew up with my grandparents and, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins. Yeah. So yes, that's where I grew up there. Um, in Montego Bay, I went to Mon the Montego Bay High School for Girls. So when I moved there, you know, I was working there. Um, I just lived there afterwards. So, you know, the part now where it's time to start taking care of myself, being a young female, you know, just to grow up to be a young lady. I spent the other part of my days in, in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Um, what was that like for you in, in Montego Bay, sort of growing up, growing up there? Um, growing up in Montego Bay, it was very, um, it was a life lesson. It, it taught me it, it's it's unfortunate, but it's like a fortune. It's like a blessing in disguise. You know, experiences that I had growing up in every part of my life, it actually, I think it really molded me to be the female that I am today. So basically anything that I went through, whether it's struggles, whether it was an amazing time in my life or, you know, amazing experiences that I had, it everything contributed to who Shanyu Muir is today. So you look back on it in a kind of happy, in a happy way then overall? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I do. Actually, um, I actually look at my life and everything that I have been through as a blessing. And, you know, that's one of the things that inspired my one of my singles called Blessings, because I just think that whatever you go through in life, there's always a learning point out of it. You know what I mean? Like, even though it may not be the best or the most exciting time in your life, there's always something that you learn from it, whether it's good or bad. So I just think that growing up, especially growing up in Jamaica, I think being a Jamaican, it really taught me how to appreciate life and appreciate what you have and how to hustle in a sense or how to stay motivated and, you know, inspire. And also to, you know, look and you, you don't just take things at, it's, it's at, at a materialistic value. You also, you try to appreciate life for exactly what it is and deeper than what you see beyond the, the naked eye. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of music, then obviously Jamaica is such a musical place. Um, you must have been exposed to music from from a very young age. From a very young age, um, growing up, by I was like eight years old, I was singing in church. Um, I used to sing at funerals. I used to sing at weddings. So singing was always a part of who I am. And writing really started in high school. That's where I would do like um, little skits or little things that little projects that we would get in high school to complete. And, you know, would have to utilize the creativity where my creativity was mostly on the writing and the music. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a good thing that, you know, to learn to learn so much about myself while growing up and in the music sense, it was really good. Yeah. So at that point, were you ever considering music to be a career? In high school, not yet. I think after I did a pageant at the Montego Bay High School for Girls, that's when I actually saw that, you know, I could go further than where I am. And there were different competitions in the, in the making, in the time frame, And I decided, you know what, I'm going to try out. I'm going to try out um, at these competitions that I'm seeing in and around, mm -hmm. in and around um, in the, my, my community. Cause they actually came to, to Montego Bay at the time um, to do like this competition called on the verge. And when I saw that, I was like, you know, the perks that comes with it, you know, when you, when you win the competition by singing or whatever your talent is, mm -hmm. it actually comes to you. Like, you know what? this is more than what you think it is. There's so much to learn. My apologies. Let me. That's all right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's so much to learn from yourself and everything that's around you. And I think that that's one of the things that really, you know, piped up my, my urge for music was because I saw that it doesn't just stop here. There's, it's a wide world by itself. 
So what was like the, some of the subjects that you were singing about and writing about in the, in the first sort of early days? Okay, so the first early days, um, after school, absolutely, after I, I finished school, I actually started singing. Let me tell you, I'm going to be very honest. When I was listening to dancehall music, I always listened to the good music. I listened to reggae music and positive, uplifting music. But I also had a J for like the, the raunchy type of side of music. So that always grabbed my interest to see how you could, it's, I think it's an art to really put sex and stuff into music to have someone else listen to your lyrics and your sound and still feel the same vibe that you do feel. So I did music like that after, after I left high school. I did cultural songs. Um, I did a song called um, Seat the Know, which I think that song was where I was telling myself, you know what, I'm going to work on something and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. I'm going to do it. You know, you're so hearing me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds great. Yeah. Um, so who were some of the artists that you were like admiring most at that sort of time? Like which artists were your favorites? Um, at that time, my favorite artists artists were um none other than the Marianne Hall, Lady Saw, you know, at the time previously known as Lady Saw. Um, and Tanya Stevens. I listened to a lot of Tanya Stevens. Funny enough, I also listened to a lot of musicals. So at the time, you know, High School Musical was popular because, you know, it's just the, just the young, youthful days. And I listened to a lot of Vibes Cartel. Um, at that time, I also, I'm a very old spirit. So I listened to a lot of Barry Hammond, a lot of, you know, Wayne. It's like all those people, but the good groove, yes. I used to listen to a lot of that music. So I used to really admire their talent and their masterpieces. And I really admired their way of work and the, the hard work that they put in and, you know, their sounds and everything. So I really admired a good few artists because I listened to a lot of genres as well. So I listened to um, Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton. So it's like a whole variety of different music. And when you were growing up, I mean, in Jamaica, it seems that, you know, um, becoming an artist is is what a lot of young men sort of aspire to be. Do you know what I mean? Like that seems to be yeah. a popular sort of career choice um, for, for men. Like, was that ever something that girls around your age were, were into as well, like becoming an artist? I honestly didn't really find anybody like me <laughs> at that time. I just felt, and it was it was a funny thing because, you know, my family didn't see music as a career. They just saw it as a hobby, which is like, it was kind of, I could say kind of discouraging in a sense, but I didn't stop to think about that because everybody has to look at life differently and how they want to be and where they want to be. So for my family, they didn't see it as something that, you know what, this could be a career where Chanel Muir is a brand. They didn't look at it like that. You know, obviously we have Caribbean parents that have different ways and different morals and different stance by which they, they, they live by. So it's like a different norm in a sense. It will be breaking the normal, um, you know, living, way of living in your family. Like the moment you do something different, the moment you're aspiring for something different, they see, they probably don't see what you see. So I saw that music is a career and it's a, it's a, it's a life path and it, it, it's more than just singing. It's more than just having fun. It's a business and it's, it's a way of life as well. So I was kind of, they, they, it's kind of discouraging when they don't see your, your dream, the, when you, how you see it. But eventually when they saw that I have the talent, you know, they started to support more, more than they did before. And yeah. <laughs> So then, I didn't see anybody like me, though. I see yeah. a lot of men, like, a, that's the thing. There are a lot of men that, you know, want to be artists, and they're trying just as much as I did. Because along my way, um, I met mostly male artists than I would meet female artists. So it's like I felt alone, in a sense, until I went further into the business. That's where I started to meet different people that are on the same path as I am. Mm -hmm. So I think where a lot of people first heard your name was through the Magnum Kings and Queens competition. Um, talk us through the whole process of you getting onto that and getting involved with that. 
Okay, so when I, when I entered Magnum Kings and Queens, I wanted to enter it the year before, but when I checked out the guidelines for Magnum Kings and Queens, they wanted you to be at a certain age. There was an age limit. So I turned 18 the July of that year, um, 2016 actually 2015 and they had the auditions in november of that of 2015. i was very very nervous to even even think that i was going to enter this competition because watching previous um competitors it was like okay i hear some lyrics and i'm like i don't think i could do this you know like but i i mean like eventually after writing music over and over again and you know always trying to be better than who you were before or always trying to master what you're doing that i think that's what gave me the drive to you be you know you, you think you can't do this but you can do this girl you could just put you could really use that brain that you got from you know and just put it together and just do something so they had the competition in november i entered the competition there were over a hundred more than a hundred competitors that wow. were at the audition wow. and i was the youngest probably most likely of them all <laughs> so wow. you know i was thinking the ratio to me actually getting through here was probably like a 40 60 or a 30 70 i'm like ah, i'm gonna try but let's see what happens because it was a different location and they have a variety of locations that they actually pick um contestants from and at this one location they're like 100 and something people and wow. then you know in kingston there's probably like 200 people so why in the world would out of everybody else i would get chosen for this but i'm like you know what i'm gonna do it i'm not gonna think like that i'm not gonna think negatively and i'm just going to put my best foot forward so when i came up to the uh, audition um you know i was thinking presentation is everything so i was in this like this this nice fit it was a nice comfortable fit and i was like you know probably even if they don't hear my voice at least when they see me they should know that i'm ready for work and I'm here for an audition and I'm presenting myself and my brand. So when I started to sing at the preliminary audition, um, there were judges, there were different judges before actual Skata and Kitty and, you know, Professor Nuts. So when I started to audition, um, I started to sing and they stopped me in the middle of my singing. And I was like, wait, I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? <laughs> like, I, I thought I was doing my best. So what's going on? So they're like, girl, you can actually sing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, that's where we're going with this. All right. And then they're like, you don't even have to sing anything else. Here's the ticket, you know, wow. to the other part to filter because they're filtering down to, you know, only a specific amount of people. Right. Okay. So I go over to the other part of the, um, no, there's another way. So there's another whole momentum built up, like so suspense. It's like the suspense was killing me. So I was like, nah, I just need to get this over with. Can y'all just let me do my thing and leave? Let me know if I'm going to get this. So, you know, um, after now we're in the front, in front of Skata Akiti and Professor Natsan. It was my turn. Trust me, my stomach was tying up in knots. Wow. I was... Was that the first time that you had performed like in front of people or like? No, it wasn't. But the thing is, in those days, every single time that I get on a stage or I'm supposed to perform in front of a large crowd, I do get nervous. Mm -hmm. Even at this point, I still do. It's just that it's not as bad as it was before. Yeah, so I was there and then uh, it's my turn. And then, you know what? I just like... Let me just sing. Let me just sing away. Just do my best. I'm just going to give it my all. And when I started singing, I realized that the feedback, that energy that the, 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 they were giving me, the crowd and even the judges were giving me, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. This is what I want to see. This is what makes me feel good. And yes, I think I'm doing my best. And, you know, they're, they're receiving that as well. So when I was finished, Kitty, you know, Kitty with her, la, 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 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, she gave me such great feedback. Um, Skata gave me good feedback and Professor Nuts as well. So I was like, yes, they're like, yes, you're going to move on to the next round. I'm like, okay, wow. <laughs> I did that, you know? Yeah, and yeah. then, you know, through the whole competition, after it, it boils down to the, to the, the castles, the red castle and blue castle and everything and, 
you know, meeting so many different people, meeting the competitors and being in that um, spot where I was competing against other artists. But then again, we could sit and have conversations about the competition was something that was immaculate. So I got to see so many different talents and I could say specifically um, Climax, who was the winner for that year. She deserved that a hundred percent because when I sit and I listen to Climax spit certain lyrics, it's like, where did she get her brain from? Because you will, you'll be so amazed to other people's talents. Like you'll be sitting there like, I would never think of that. I would never think to put my words like that and, you know, deliver in such a way, but someone else does. And you, you do have to admire and be appreciative of another person's talent. And I'm very, very happy for her. Um, even that time, the, the, I could say I was sad when I was eliminated because it's obviously, it was something that I was working for. So I would usually, you know, go out to campaign with my team and stuff like that. And, you know, to be eliminated that day, it, it was heartbreaking, but I was grateful for the journey and the exposure that I got because I didn't even know I would be at that spot, you know, because even though I believe in myself and I, I know where I was, I wanted to go and where I was going, I still had doubts. Everybody's going to have doubts somewhat, somehow, and it's a competition. So you have to think of it. You have to think, what if this happens? What if that happens? Even though you're putting your best in. So it was a really good competition and the feedback that i got from the judges that they were not biased at all to me they let me know exactly what was what and what i needed to work on and it's really good to take constructive criticism mm -hmm. because you can use that and apply it to your knowledge and expand your your talent expand your craft and you know just work forward on everything that you're doing and it, it, it helped me along the way and even now you know working with the crew members and even the the talents and also the judges it teaches you that business in this music, you'll always have such a platform. You'll have, you'll have judges, you'll have spectators, you'll have a live audience and you'll have different people in the business that you have to work with. So I think that it really molded me to be where I am. So, you know, you work with different people, everybody has a different job. Everybody has a different description that they need to do to follow through. So mm -hmm. it was a very good experience, Magnum Kings and Queens. So how high, uh, how high did you sort of set your hopes to actually um, win the competition? Like, were you sort of putting all your hopes into it? <laughs> actually, I, my intention was definitely to go there and win. Um, if I should be very honest, as a female, I, if you see another talent that you think, like, okay, if this is my competition, you are intimidated. So I have been intimidated before, you know, during the competition, because you look at, at, at another person's talent and you see how the crowd is receptive of them. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, OK, you, she did pretty good. He did pretty good. Like, I need to top that. Every time somebody does something as awesome as that, you think you need to top it. You think you need to go above and beyond and do better than what you've seen you know to feel like you know you really have this or even do as much as they did so i was intimidated for some reason and for the first part of the, the competition they did pick on me so <laughs> they did bring me out you know so it was i i i i was intimidated for somewhat but you know i still went home and i did my research did my homework and you know come back with a better song the next time and come back with a better performance the next time and you know just keep working and i think um you know i mean there's so many sort of contestants in that competition and i think um you were one of the crowd's favorite you know what i mean did you feel like you you were sort of um did you get that feedback from the crowd you know that sense that you know you you were really warmed to by by the audience Yes, I did. They actually really have me feel welcome. It's like, because they knew I was the youngest one there. It's like, I'm the little baby of the competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they wouldn't, they wouldn't like make me feel as if I'm not putting the work in, but you can tell they, they actually give me the impression to know that, okay, Chanel, you just killed this mm -hmm. in a post to Chanel. You did yourself, but you could do better. You know what I mean? Like they actually, if you can read into how your crowd you know, reacts to you, you'll know when you've done exceptionally well and when you've just done okay, good, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, 
what I mean? So they 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 put a little pressure on me here and there, but they were good. <laughs> they were good. So you said that you were really heartbroken when when you know you finally got eliminated. Um, talk us through those next few days after the competition. Like what what were you what was your like emotions sort of at the time? <laughs> I was all over the place. I actually, when I came off the stage that day, I went backstage and I was crying. I was overwhelmed because at that point, I just realized, oh, wow. I just got kicked out of a competition in front of a lot of people. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's disappointing. But then everybody, the way the competitors, they came around and be like, this is not the end girl. Like you are super talented and you did exceptionally well and we love you. So the way they took to me and said, you know what? You did good. This, this is just a milestone that you're going to come over. And, you know, they really embraced me and really gave me courage in a sense, you know, they really did. And, you know, fans who I now gained a lot of fans who I didn't have before. So they were like, you know, it's sad that you're, you're not in the competition anymore, but we still love you and we're still looking forward to more work from you. So it was, it was sad, but it was bittersweet mm -hmm. because at that point, I realized that I gained fans, so many fans at that time and so many supporters and they were very supportive. I've had people even know that could tell you, listen, I've been listening to Chanel Muir since Magnum Kings and Queens. So, and that's been a long way because that's been since 2016, 15. So that, yeah, I gained, I, great, I gained great people and I retained some amazing fans from there. Mm. And obviously, you know, you must have set your, your hopes really high to win it and to then have that taken away, did you did you see a way that you could get into the industry after that? Like, did you, did you? Yeah, absolutely. Because um, at that time I was working with Google Good Productions, so I was being endorsed by their um company by Zoom's company. So I saw he wanted to do music even after the fact. So it was a good it was a good move because a lot of people were reaching out to me even after that, not only Google production, but there were other productions that were reaching out, you know, wanting to do tracks and stuff like that. But in that moment, that's when I migrated to the U S so the, the window kind of slimmed down for a second because I'm no longer easy at reach mm -hmm. and I'm in California, like three hours behind the normal time. Yeah. So it feels like I'm in a whole different world. You know what I mean? And, and at that time it wasn't, music wasn't as broad and easily accessible as it is now. So back then, if I'm going to do dance hall, I would have to be somewhat placed in, in, in Jamaica right. to really make a great impact, mm -hmm. you know, but no, with the help of the networking Instagram and the help of YouTube and all the different things that has enhanced in features since then, you know, that's why a lot of people know who I am now. Mm -hmm. yes. So, Talk us through those first couple of weeks in, in America. What was that like adjusting to, to life there? <sighs> when I just left and I got off the plane, I don't know if it was the, the anticipation, but I was like, okay, <laughs> this was what I didn't know all this time. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's just a different place. It just felt <laughs> yeah. like, okay, it's, there's the road, there's the buildings maybe a little higher, but it's, it's just, it's just another place. I don't know what I was thinking if I was going out to space or something, but... <laughs> you got a bit disappointed. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, after, you know, migrating to the... It was a whole different environment, too, because now I had to adapt to not living like I was on an island. <laughs> no, I'm in a whole different environment with different people and coming up to challenges like racism and, you know, this is not what I've experienced in Jamaica because everybody mm -hmm. out of many one people and, you know, we don't, we don't do that in Jamaica. So now I have to encounter people who look at your color, people who just feel that they should put you in a class when they look at you and, you know, along with just adjusting to different homes and different environments and work the work world is completely different than what it is back home in Jamaica and schooling and education and the different things that you have to do and get sorted out credit in in America is different there are so many things that I had to learn being in America now my life is changing now I have to focus on a lot of different things so in the moment of doing that to survive 
I I couldn't do music as much as I wanted to in full time. Mm-hmm. No, I have to go to work. I have to do two jobs. If I'm if I'm wanting to get a car, I cannot just do one job because that's just yeah. paying for rent or whatever the case is. So you know the work world over here really took over. So the the first couple of weeks, I got a job at Didi's. The the second month, I got a job at Didi's. That's um the local retail re, um retail store in America, and. When I got a job there, I got a job as a seasonal associate. So I was supposed to only work for the Christmas um, season. Okay. Oh, yeah. However, the manager, they saw that I, I'm a hard worker. I put a lot of effort and I'm very dedicated to my job, even though it wasn't a permanent job. And I got um, employee of the week for the first week when I was, when I was there. And then after that, I got hired on as a permanent associate. After that, a few months, I got a promotion to another, uh, a higher um, stance in the, in the company. And then I've worked with BDs for three years after that. So I think that I don't regret any of it because in that workplace, I learned a lot that I applied to my life and my business time here. For example, time management and being, you know, dedicated and hardworking, no matter what position you're in. And I think this stage in my life contributed to my breakout single, Yamabella, mm-hmm. because I saw that, you know, people were in, in the U S and they're living a certain lifestyle, but when they go back home to different places, they want it to seem as if they're living the best of life here. So I'm like, you know what? I'm about to tell y'all, I'm about to bust y'all <laughs> secret up in here. Y'all acting like, yeah, I'm a good two shoes, something, something, so me, I go bust on the secret and talk the things down, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first few weeks in, in America, you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. It was a completely different environment. But, you know, eventually going forward, I adapted. And, you know, I'm glad I did, too. I'm glad I did come here because it's there are a lot of opportunities. Um, I think it teaches you how to be an adult. Mm-hmm. Oh, the America teaches you how to be responsible and don't live your life like, like there's no tomorrow. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> trust me, once you wake up, there's a tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you money, gotta... <laughs> money's coming out of your account tomorrow. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you said that you didn't really get a chance to do much music. You know, you were, you were tied up with two jobs. Um, did, did you ever sort of think about giving up music? You know, did you think that you could, you could continue being an artist? I did give it up a set in a sense, not completely, but I was going through this small phase in my life where my life changed drastically within a two week period. Um, I lost some family members back home in Jamaica and in a violent way, gun violence, and it really shook my family and it really took a toll on myself because I'm a very family oriented person. And I think once, once my family is affected by something, it affects me as well. So when I was going through that, I didn't feel like I wanted to do music and I'm very spiritual. So I felt like I needed to get closer to God. I felt like nothing in this world was about to help me and I was about to lose my mind. So let me just take myself off of this place that I'm in right now, trying to do this music and just find myself again before I move further. So at one point I did, you know, give music a break, like completely. And, you know, I didn't know I would go back to it, but eventually after I put myself through that self therapy and, you know, got to that comfortable at peace moment again, I started to do music again, which led to me traveling from California to New York and then to Florida um, to find that bone. Like I need to find somewhere where music lives. Mm -hmm. Where I was in California, it's a beautiful place. I loved my family um, that I live with. I live with my dad and and my dad's wife and, and her child. And it was an amazing home. But my drive for music took me from my comfort zone I was too comfortable (laughs) I was way too comfortable so I needed to get out there and I needed to find my music bone like I needed to find where it was I was searching 
physically and mentally. I was searching. And, you know, I drove from California to, to New York, where I was based for a while. I did some tracks there, and then I moved to Florida. And, you know, we and Papa Dan start to do some more, mu more music. More music. That sounds good. More music. <laughs> <laughs> we did some more music, and, you know, ta-da. So talk about your link up with Papa Dan, because you, you've had some great... Um, tracks together and it seems like you got a real good chemistry so like how did you two first link up so you know if i should remember clearly he linked me and he said like he wanted to do some music i'm like oh definitely you know just send me some beats and we'll you know we'll get into it because at the time i knew of him because of tj's song mm -hmm. up top you know so I heard that that's how I was familiar with the name Poppy Don Music. So that's yeah. what I always remember. So when he reached out, I was like, yeah, of course, you know, you, you do, you've done some amazing work. So, you know, why not, you know, let's collaborate and do some work. And he sent me a few beats. Um, we've always communicated and, you know, keep kept a link. And um, he sent me this particular beat where I wrote the song called Vex When. And then that's how Stylo came into the whole thing because he heard me with the song on his, his live where I was performing on oh, his shit. live one night. Yes, and he was like, yo, that song that do it, man. <laughs> and he's like, yo, we need, to, we need to do this. We could do this together. And I was, I'm very grateful for him for doing that because not a lot of artists that were on his, you know, his pedestal or you know in his position rather would acknowledge me because mm -hmm. at that time you know me and Papa Dan were working together we're working on getting some music out there and you know if an opportunity arises, we're going to go ahead and grab it if it's the, the if we think it's the best opportunity and you know with Stylo when he jumped on that track and you know after doing a song with Nicki Minaj I'm like I am definitely grateful for this and you know I'm grateful for him to be so humble and mm -hmm. you know actually take a look at my talent for a second and you know did what he could so when we did vex when we see that the people loved it and everybody was kind of listening again to chanel muir so you know after doing vex when and papi dan was like shan more music you know and we go he's like i want to drop this beat and i think it's a perfect fit for you and i did two songs and then when he heard 3d he's like Yo, you see, this is a perfect song. Like this, you even named this song already. It's called 3D. I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, Sean, this is the song. Like <laughs> we have that chemistry. Like he'll tell me like, yo, you need to know that. Yo, you, your body know like, yo, you yeah. don't know your body like, you know? So he's always been very, very motivated. He always motivated me um, to keep doing music and, you know, don't give up, don't be discouraged, don't get distracted, but stay focused and, you know, put the work in. And then before you know it, we did 3D. And then after 3D, he's like, yo, Sean, next song, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so next song. And I'm like, okay, let's go. And I did Yama Bella. Talk about that because, I mean, it's a song that you talked about a lot. Um, but for those who don't know, just tell us what what you mean by Yamabella. <laughs> so Yamabella, <laughs> it refers to any female who lives her life to impress everyone, everyone else but herself, but puts herself in predicaments by doing so. So a person, a person, if we're going to say Yamabello would ref refer to a man, but you know, I genderize it to females because I'm all about women empowerment. And I want to, I want with that song, it's not to bash a female. I wanted to highlight the things that, you know, happens in today's world that doesn't necessarily need to happen. And I wanted females to understand that you need to appreciate yourself, appreciate what you have until you can give yourself more and work hard to do that. You know, nothing comes easy, nothing comes free. And if it's free, it cannot be good. <laughs> so, because nothing comes free. So um, with that song, Yamabella is a woman that doesn't prioritize and she just go go out and, you know, party and don't do the things. Don't, it's not have responsible. You, have, you ever been a, have you ever been a Yamabella? Have you ever been a Yamabella? <laughs> no. Never? <laughs> well, when I was younger, I probably could categorize myself as a Yamabella, but... I think I don't think when it goes for girls who are under a certain age. Okay, okay. I don't think you can be a Yamabella with without the knowledge of certain things. I think you can be, you are a Yamabella when you know that you're doing it. 
but you still do it. You know what I mean? I think when you're younger, you're naive to certain things. You don't learn until you learn. So I cannot say I was a Yamabella, but if I know that if I get up today and I have $200 in my bank account, right? And I have $200 and I'm going to take that $200 and buy a phone when I got a hundred dollar bill, right? To pay like a water bill or something. What, what am I going to do? Buy the phone or have my water get cut off? There's a difference, right? But no, a Yamabella is going to go right ahead and buy the phone. <laughs> she don't care about the water. <laughs> so um, is that something that you've noticed like more in Jamaica or in the States or is it something that's just universal, do you think? I think that is everywhere. It's so funny, but I see it where I am. But I think that is something that is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because even, in, even in, in America, a lot of people, they depend on, what do you call it? The, the, the EBT thingy, the, the, the welfare stuff. They okay. don't need to, you know, but they do. Just because they want to have that. You know what I mean? Like Instead of going out and working to earn it, they rather someone give it to them right even if even if they're not in a position if they don't, they're not necessarily in a position to need to use it they still do and then you have people in jamaica that come to the us they're over here wasting time don't want to put the work in get them like they're over here using up the credit cards and acting as if they're living this big lifestyle renting vehicles renting bentleys renting audis range rovers all the good stuff buying Gucci belts, Gucci this, Louis this, everything, all the brands, and then they go back home and they don't have a dollar in the pocket because they spent all this on all these brands just to look good, you know? And they go back home, they don't have a house, they don't have a bed to sleep on. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, I think this happens everywhere. Like, people just want to live to show people like they're living a life. Why not actually live the life so they can see it instead of trying to show them that you're living the life? That's my point. Like, that's why I don't think I could have been. Is that, something, is that something that you've noticed more as we've got further, like into the digital age with like, you know, Instagram exactly. and stuff like that? Exactly. Because everybody wants to post stuff like, oh, relationship goals. Here we are. Yay. But when they get off that Instagram and they go home, they're fighting back and forth. <laughs> and people don't know that. They're behind the doors, knocking shelves off, knocking glass, everything. They just show people what they want them to see. So. I just think that it has to do a lot with that. And it has, a, I think everywhere has this problem, every single place. And yeah. it kind of, um, you touched on it before, like obviously with the whole start of lockdown, you know, you were doing the Instagram lives. Um, talk us through the, the, the beginning of the lives because that's where I think um, Yama Bella really kind of bust, wasn't it? Through the through Yeah, the yeah, through the lives. So when I was doing the live shows, it was a, <laughs> it was, I used to sing to like 18 people a day. <laughs> I used to sing to 18 people. I would get on my live that 18, 20 people would sit there and listen to me sing. And I'm like, I enjoy it because it's something that I enjoy. Remember, I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not, no, there's, I'm not gaining anything but supporters, you know, so. I get up on my life, you know, I do my little makeup thingy or, you know, put a little hair on, you know, look presentable and I sing. I sing, I perform, I communicate, I interact with my fans. And from then, COVID-19 comes along. Nobody's really going anywhere. So everybody has a lot of time on their hands. What are they going to do? Sit on their phones. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Let me use this opportunity to, you know, show them my talent, give them something to watch, give them something to listen to. And I think that, you know, going live eventually, the fan base started to grow. People started to share the live and everybody else is now looking forward to me going on, on live. And then the big, the bigger platforms, they started to create competitions for like, you know, anyone who has talent to come and, you know, display their talent here and there and, you know, do what they have to do. And people would send me these lives and then I would go on there, you know, send my request and join in on the live and display my talent and I would gain followers from there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's where it started. I started to do lives here and there and then my live and then people would, you know, just come and support, show their love and, you know, start listening to my music until all these different songs started to drop. That's crazy. And when you first started doing the lives, how many followers did you have, like, roughly? Roughly around 18K. 
Wow. That's probably crazy. Probably about 20-something K. Yeah, I think I wrote, yeah, about 18 K, I think. That's, that's crazy. And now you're on like two, nearly 250. That's, yes. that's crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Like, I sit there and I watch, I was like, what? Where did so much people come from? <laughs> and um, when you were doing the lives to begin with, like, were you doing it with the intention of, okay, I'm, you know, strategically building my fan base here? Or was it more of a just like, I'm just going to have fun and see what happens? It was more of, a, I'm going to have fun and see what happens. Like, I'm like, you know, I love to sing anyway. And I love to entertain um, people who support me. So if I, if I can interact with my fans, you know, I'm not beside them, obviously. But if I can find ways and means to interact with them, let them get to know who they're listening to. I was like, you know, let me do that. You know, and I'm like, I'm having fun with it anyway. So why not? So mm. that was a good thing. And you started on about, what, 18 to 20 per live. Um, how long did it take for you to, to build up to the numbers that you're on? Like, what was the sort of transition from, from that? After a month, I saw a drastic change. I mean, you like, doing it every after, day, every single day? I did probably like five days out of the seven days, I would wow. do it. But it's like hours upon hours. I would go live from like 9.30 in the night and I don't get off probably like till the next morning most of the time. Wow. Cause they're like, oh, you need to come back live. They're telling you like, you can't go anywhere. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know. So eventually, that really changed. Um, it started at twenty something, and it started going up to hundred and something. Then I see two hundred and something. Then you go four hundred. Then I'm like, what am I gonna do to entertain four hundred people sitting there looking at me? I can't even hear them, but I see their messages. But I'm like, how am I gonna entertain twenty? And then I look, fifteen hundred. I'm like, what? <laughs> Crazy. What? What are you guys doing over here? <laughs> um, yeah, but it, trust me, it's a real task to really be sitting there and having to talk to fifteen hundred people. Just sitting there looking at you, just expecting you to entertain them. Like, anyhow, anyhow, you got to do it, girl, do it. <laughs> you know? That must, have been, um, that must have been really exhausting then, doing it after a while. It was. And then they will literally DM you like, why did you end the live? Girl, I got a <laughs> life. What do you think? <laughs> I've got to sleep. I've got to eat. Right? I got to sleep, eat, bathe, something. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, but they really grew. My fan base really grew over time. And I think that my fans have a lot to do with that because they're the one that share the content. They're the one that show a lot of support. They go stream the music and they, you know, they do their part. Mm -hmm. So since the success of Yamabella, you know, you've been releasing a lot of hits, um, a lot of songs, you know, um, you. were these songs, any of these songs um, sort of hidden away or were you writing them all now? Like are they all like recent songs? They're all recent. <laughs> They're all recent. I still have a few songs that I've had in the pipeline that I'm looking forward to dropping soon. But these songs that are already on the way to, you know, they're recent songs. Mm -hmm. And I guess now you kind of, um, it's, it's a pressure now that you've got, you've got to keep up now to, to keep releasing songs. Yeah, I got to remain consistent because I think we broke them bad in a sense. Like we spoiled them to, you know, mm. expect music like round the clock. But going forward, even though they expect that, I definitely want to complete a project first before I put it to them. Because even though they want it, they're the same persons that will look at you and be like, I don't like it, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so I definitely want to work on projects and complete them and, you know, market them the right way and produce them and put them out the right way to the fans so they can, you know, love what the work that's been done. Mm -hmm. So we spoke about your um, connection with Papi Don Music. Um, talk about your relationship with Good Good Productions. So Good Good Productions, I've known Zoom since 2016. Yeah, 2016. We've always maintained a business relationship, which is an amazing thing because he's he's more he's been experienced in the in the entertainment field. So when he has, you know, he's like a mentor. So he would give me a lot of um, advice here and there up until now where we just came to a conclusion like, hey, this is it. You know, let's let's really make this official. We've been doing work from then, but let's make it official and let's get this ball rolling. Like you are the thing. So let's get it going, you know. And I think that I have a wonderful team, especially, you know, Sasha right now, she's handling a lot between me and my um, teammate, Danique. So she's been doing it exceptionally well so, so far. 
and it's something that I really appreciate my team because you're once I have a good once you have a good team, you are a strong person in a sense because they represent you, you represent them. So mm -hmm. I think that you know I'm looking forward to so much work with Good Good Production. Even though the COVID thing, you know, it's kind of minimizing a lot of things, mm -hmm. but so far so good. And I'm really so grateful you, to have them. Are you signed um, just to their label or are you like managed by them as well? Or how, how does it work? Yeah, so I'm signed and managed by them. Okay, so and are you have you got like um, a certain amount of releases that you've got to live up to? Like, or how, how does that whole sort of thing work? Yeah, um, I will definitely be working on my album very soon because, you know, I have a few things that I need to complete between now and then of, of our um, contract. But... It doesn't feel like a contract. It just feels like, you know, what it was or what it is. It just feels like work and it just feels like I have a wonderful team and we're just putting things together and, you know, just doing what we need to do. So we have some work to come out and, you know, I have some things that I need to complete. So we're just working on that right now. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about performing live. You must be kind of frustrated that you can't see the full reaction of songs like Yamabella, like performing. Yes, movies. I wish I could see it, but they're making us hold out, but it's okay. <laughs> so have you had a chance to perform at all, like since the start? Of yes, the I have performed in, um, I have performed a few shows actually in, in, in the US and I have a few more shows. I have two shows this weekend, one in Washington DC. And then the next day I have a show in Queens, New York. So, and then the 24th, I got a show with Dex that ups called Entanglement. So it, the shows are happening, but not in Jamaica. It's more okay. like here you know, under the, yeah. the, the headlines. Yeah. And are the, the, um, the American fans like fully tuned into what you're doing or would you say that it's more of a Jamaican Holy. crowd? I think they're everywhere because <laughs> the shows that I've been to, I could hardly hear myself when they start wow. singing. So it's like, it's an amazing feeling, you know, just to go out and see how people that support you would love to see you in person and love to see you and hear you perform for them. And I think the reception is like, it's everything. I feel grateful. I'm so humbled by everything that's happening right now. And do you feel fully confident now when you're performing or is that something that you're still building, would you say, your skills? I think every crowd is different. Every single crowd is different. And every performance, I basically look at myself and see where I could have done something better. Because the fact that every crowd is different, not every crowd is going to move the same way or be as vibrant as the other crowd. So I just think it's it's teaching me to get to know my area or get to know my, my spectators or my live audience to know how to interact with them on a live show. So... I think that each stage show, it strengthens me for the next one. And, you know, I'm just learning along the way. And yeah, it's good. So what other areas um, do you feel like you're, you'd are you like to work on more at the moment? Because you're still, you know, a relatively new artist, you know, in a yeah. lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I could work more on, in, in stage, stage um, stagecraft area, I think I could work more on like crowd interactions a little more um i do interact with them but i think that i could straighten that part and then mm, projection i maybe i think i work on projection because i honestly i don't even know if it's me because i'll be singing but i can't hear me but i can hear them <laughs> so okay. they're basically outdoing me so it's maybe that's somewhat of it but we'll see we'll see going further <laughs> and um in terms of the the writing are you writing all the songs that you're releasing yeah. So if I'm writing all of them. Yeah. 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 So most my verses and songs that I've released, I've, I've written them. Mm. So talk us through the, the songwriting process. Like what do you have a, a set sort of technique that you use for songwriting or? Honestly, I think I may be like a weird writer because I literally have to be in the mood to write. You know, some people can just write just because it is. I have to have a certain vibe to really put something awesome together. Like the content, and I always just try to have content and different topics, not just something that you hear every day. So writing for me, it has to do with meditation. It has to do with topic and content. It has to do with um, incorporating a daily lifestyle. So, you know, 
just so people can relate to the music when they hear it. And I like to, to really meditate on the beat so I can have a good flow, good lyrics, good rhythm. So, you know, it complements the song that I'll be um, recording on. So yeah, writing for me. And I love writing actually. I love the fact that I can sit and just meditate on music and just put words together and just create a beautiful sound that people love, you know? So I love writing and, you know, I keep practicing. I keep, cause I just think that, you know, the only thing you can do is get better. So, you know, I just keep practicing every day, putting pen to paper, even if literally I'm just li listening to the beat. And when I'm done, my paper is as blank as this. I still want to sit there and write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it just ha it just has to do with the to do with the the vibe at the moment. So when it comes to recording the song, then obviously, are you getting are you recording with the producers like in the studio or you how is that all working? Because obviously, some of yeah. the producers are based in Jamaica. Um, and most of them most of them are based in Jamaica, right? Yeah, most of them are in Jamaica. Um, but with recording, before I've been recording with um Benso, he's an he's an artist actually. And I think when you record with an artist who is also an engineer, it's really good because they're familiar with the keys, they're familiar with the sounds and different things like that. And if you're not doing something as energetic as you should, they could tell you, hey, you could do better here, you could do better there. But um, um, for other songs, I record in Jamaica as well with my team, if needed be. If I'm in that location, that's where I record, but I record here um, in the studio after my work. Like I'd like to get the material first and then go into the studio and record it, or sometimes I could just vibe it in the studio. So it just depends. So we spoke about, you know, the, the great run that you're having, you know, you've released so many singles recently. Um, do you feel like that's something that you can keep up? You know, that, that constant work rate, that constant um, output of songs? I think so. I think so. And I just think that, you know, it just takes a lot of staying focused to be consistent, um, paying attention to details and, you know, not dropping the ball, you know, being, keeping up that work ethic. Cause once you're putting your all into it, once you're doing it, it has to be done. You know, you can't just expect that you're going to all get two songs and be like, okay, I can rest. Mm -mm. <laughs> That's where it starts. That's where the ball game starts. No, you're proving to your fans like, Hey, I got material for you and I'm going to give it to you. Um, for no, I, I have a, other songs that I need to release, but I, you know, I want to start working on my album pretty soon because that's something I think I want to put the project together. You know, it's so beautiful to just sit and just see like someone just say, Hey, here's 15 songs. Go and enjoy this album over here. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk to you, in a year, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I want to start working on my album real soon. I, I want to give them the singles that I have for them so far. And then just, you know, just go into that work mode, that deep work mode, and then just give them something amazing. And one of my favorite songs that you've released recently is um, Loyalty with Vibes Cartel. Tell us about how that whole came about. Cause that's, you know, a massive feature. Yes. Yes. Um, I see, yo, I've been listening to cartels since I was a child. So, you know, for the opportunity, like Shot Boss really, she made it possible. And, you know, when she, when she started to show so much love and support to me and my music, I just felt the energy was right, you know, and then the moment I heard that beat, I was like, yo, what is going on? This is life right here. <laughs> Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, and to be doing a whole collaboration with the, the, with the voice of the Vibes Cartel, I was like, okay, okay, stop playing with me now, you play, you play too much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's an amazing feeling. It's, a, it's really a blessing. It's really a blessing. Cause you know, to be just before I was just Chanel, just doing music and then no, you got the shot boss, you know? acknowledging it's 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 truly a blessing right I'm, I'm speechless to tell you the truth i don't even know how to express what i want to say but yeah <laughs> and do were you um expecting all this success like is this something that you feel like you were um yeah expecting i always dreamt of it i've always dreamt of it i've always and everything i did in regards to music is because i feel what i want and I just think that anything that I want, I work hard for it. So everything that's happening now, 
if somebody pinch me, I probably wake up. <laughs> Cause this feels like a dream, but I know it's it's the hard work and the dedication. It's showing the results is there. And I think historically in dancehall, especially, it seems like there's only really been one kind of spot available for for a female artist to be really successful. You know, obviously. Yeah. Spoke about Lady Sword and you know obviously Spice, but now it seems like there's more and more women breaking through, and they're also in their own lanes. You know what I mean? They're not. It's not just yeah. one now. Do you feel like there's space for all of you to be top artists in your own right? Absolutely. Imagine going on a stage show, for example, some fest, and when you look, you got like five to ten females on their dominating music you see how amazing me i talk about it and it feels so good to even say that just imagine because you have different females with different talents and amazing artists and they're so talented females out here and i love to see it and just imagine on a stage show where these females just come together and just dominate the music that's that that would be such a historic moment mm -hmm. and i'm waiting to see that because every woman in this business they have earned their spot you can't claim someone else's spot it doesn't belong to you if it's not yours you're not gonna get it so i just think that they're very talented beautiful black females beautiful different races no matter who you are whatever you're doing as an artist and you're showing and the results are there no, nothing else can beat that and I just love to see the females really doing their thing. And right now, the females are doing their thing. So I love to see it. I love to see it. So Chanel, um, finally, when can we expect this, this debut album to drop, do you, do you think? Uh, by early next year, I hope. Wow, okay. Oh, yeah, by early next year. But I'll be working on that, especially in the latter part of this time. I'll be working on it. So hopefully, if not, early next year mid next year that's too long come on that's that's, <laughs> a, bit late. that's a bit of a wait now you can't wait but yeah probably you're on it yeah it'll, it'll be early. It, it will be early next year let me just say that it will and be are you going to feature any of the current singles on there or is it going to be all fresh material i think i want to do all fresh materials let's just give i'm gonna just give them something i never heard before just when they hear it it'll be like okay we never heard this and you know it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Yeah, like, but I, I'm gonna give them fresh, fresh material. All right, Chanel. Well, we look forward to hearing that and um, all the best with the continued success. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. it was a